first uh, webinar, ABTOS is trying to run. Let me try to move it. Good. Um, so APTOS is a society. We uh, put telemedicine as a priority, uh, in particular in Asia Pacific region. We are, I, I'm not that capable, but the way that we are able to convene a big group of, a group of council members, they are all very capable people in terms of delivering telemedicine. And also a lot of them, a lot of our council members, they have very strong uh, interests on artificial intelligence. So this gives us a very solid uh, foundation to use uh, ABTOS as a platform to exchange our information, our knowledge, and then also allow people to use this platform. For example, if you try to understand how to deploy telemedicine in your country, so if there's some technical questions, so that you will always, always welcome to ask this, uh, the society how we can do it better in your country. So uh, we actually, we, the, the, tonight we're going to uh, run the first uh, webinar, but then uh, we're going to run this like a monthly webinar uh, program. So every second Friday, we're going to run a webinar, one, only one hour. So tonight we'll, we'll ha we have, uh, we're very honored to have uh, Dr. Alakos Caesar uh, representing WHO headquarters. She will give us an opening remark and then we will follow by a keynote lecture by Professor Tan Wong from Singapore, everybody know him. So he's going to talk about heading of morphology in the post COVID-19 uh, uh, era or new, norm, new normal. Then most importantly, after this half an hour lecture, we're going to have another half an hour that allow our, our council member to be the panelist. And then we will discuss what happened in the clinic during or after the COVID-19 and how may telemedicine change the way we practice. So APTOS actually run the first annual meeting in Beijing in 2016. At that time, we just got less than 100 participants in the conference. But then we followed by another meeting in Hong Kong uh, in 2017, and another more, even more successful meeting in Singapore in 2018. I think this is the foreign minister of Singapore and we're really happy to celebrate the inauguration of the ABTOS conference together. And we, very recently last year, we ran a, a very, very successful uh, ABTOS conference in Chennai, India, hosted by Avavin. So all these annual uh, conference, annual meetings, really uh, supported by a, a, a very strong local host and also by a lot of council members and, uh, and also the conference participants. So in, during the Qingnai annual meeting, we really run the first big data competition, 2019. We received a uh, entry, two, nearly 3,000 teams participate in this big data competition. It's basically for artificial intelligence. And then we have uh, over around uh, 800,000 entry. So this is a very, become a very hot program in the cargo uh, 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 program in 2019. So this is, uh, thank you very much again for the general, for the very generous uh, uh, support uh, from uh, Avavin. They provide a lot of data for DR uh, uh, image classification for this big data task. So, so now I'm gonna hand over to Dr. Alakos from WHO uh, headquarters. So doctors, Dr. Alakos is uh, joined WHO in September, 2014. She served as the chair a professional of medical society as a faculty in United Kingdom, Southampton University. And, but now, now she's actually overseeing WHO work, WHO's work on vision, hearing, rehabilitation, and disability. So uh, now I pass to Dr. Aragosi, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ming. And let me say that it's a great pleasure to be here with all of you today. And, um, and, and also good, uh, good afternoon and good morning. And for some of you also, uh, good evening from Geneva, um, from Geneva at WHO. 
So, Anta, you know, when I was invited to open this series, I accept it because I consider that it's extremely important from a WHO perspective to be here. One of the things that uh, COVID-19 has uh, shown and this public health emergency has shown is that all different sectors and actually all different also specialty or subsectors within the health sectors are learning and are adapting to the, to the new situation. And um, what this webinar series for me also demonstrate is that there is also a lot of learning going on on the, on the eye care sector. And that is extremely important because all of us need to, to adapt to the, new, to the new situation. And uh, one uh, of the areas where, or the one of the approaches that demonstrate, or that is being most discussed in the context of this adaptation has been telehealth. And in this concrete uh, area, in the area of eye care is teleophthalmology. For that reason, it is of utmost, utmost importance that the experiences are shared among health professionals. And from a WHO perspective, perspective, I would like to emphasize three key words linked to three key messages. And actually, leave you with these three key words and three key messages uh, during the discussion. And these key three words are evidence, is integration, and it is equity. And in terms of evidence, why it is important in the context of this series to talk to of uh, evidence? Because it is not enough simply to share experiences of how teleophthalmology works, but also to share the evidence behind all these practices. It is extremely important that we collect the evidence of what works, what are the approaches that works in terms of teleophthalmology, uh, and with which one we obtain the same outcomes as with other approaches that are provided or the other intervention or the, uh, when interventions are provided face to face. The reason why it's so important to collect the evidence is because then those strategies and those interventions that can be implemented with through ophthalmology can be a scale up. But we need to make sure that those are those those are a scale up for which we have the evidence that we obtain the wished outcomes for our patients. And, uh, and we need also to be able to answer questions like, for example, what is the acceptability of opto, um, teleophthalmology from the size, uh, from the side of, uh, of patients? And we have an opportunity during the COVID-19 period to be able to put in practice uh, the, this, this approach and also collect that evidence. So the, same, the, second, uh, con or the, the second word that I wanted to leave with you is the, the, the word of integration. And I would like to link this uh, to the messages that we give in the World Report on Vision. And one of the messages that we give in the World Report on Vision is that there is at least one billion people around the world that still do not have access to the eye care services they need. And one of the reasons that for which we link uh, or that we think that this situation and we portray it like that in the World Report on Vision, why this there is so many people still not accessing eye health, uh, eye care, um, eye care, is because up to now, in very in many settings and in many countries of the world, eye care services are not integrated and not seen part of the mainstream 
uh, health services. And we need to change this situation. And moving forward, it would be also important to reflect how we can make sure that teleophthalmology is provided in, the, in an integrated fashion to other telehealth approaches and how teleophthalmology can also be provided in an integrated fashion and being considered a part of other at other health services. So it is also important to reflect of, um, on this in your, in your discussion. And the third uh, word and the third message is in terms of equity. We need to make sure we cannot maintain this, situa this situation of still having at least one billion people around the world without getting the eye care services they need. We need to change that and we need to make sure that eye care services are, or that everyone who needs eye care services has access to those services without financial hardship. And this will only be possible if we strengthen eye care at the primary healthcare level. And there are tremendously linkage or the tremendous linkages between teleophthalmology and the provision of eye care services in primary healthcare. So we need to make sure that we explore those, inter those linkages and that we strengthen also, the, that we think of teleophthalmology as a, an approach in which, based on which we can strengthen also eye care services as primary healthcare level. That is also one of the messages of the World Report on Vision. So I will not be able to stay all the time with you during this first webinar, but I, I will still stay at, at least for another 20 minutes. And then um, during the discussion, I, I really would encourage you to uh, consider these, uh, these three keywords and these three messages in terms of evidence, integration, and equity. Thank you. Back to you, Ming. You are mute me. Mink, you are mute. Yes, sorry. So, so thank you very much for, for your time, Alakos. I understand how busy you are in Geneva. And uh, I, I also understand that in 20 minutes time, you've got to attend another uh, UN meeting. So thank you again for your support. Um, okay, so then we will have our next, oh, I, I will hand over to uh, Professor Tan Wong. So Professor Tan Wong is a well-known uh, ophthalmologist and also re top researcher. And he, he's also a, a leader. He's a medical director of uh, SNEC, one of the largest tertiary hospital in Asia Pacific. Uh, he he's not only a, a great researcher, but he's also a good leader and uh, very visionary. So tonight we're very uh, honored to have Professor Tian Wong to join us and also uh, to, to share with us a, a webinar lectures on uh, uh, a keynote lecture on teleophthalmology in the post COVID-19 new law. So now, now is your stage, Tian, I hand it over to you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. I'm going to start my screen sharing. Uh, so I'd like to uh, again uh, welcome everyone here and of course, uh, thank uh, Ming and everybody for the opportunity to share. And I really like, uh, uh, you know, the whole words of, really wise words of uh, uh, Alaka on having evidence, showing uh, integration and equity. And I think that this is something that we need to do to separate what is a fair and what is hype from what we can push on a tele ophthalmology and telemedicine forward. So I think this is a really a good opportunity. And I would say that Ming um, and the council members, it's been wonderful to see the society grow. Uh, and um, it is even more relevant and important 
uh, as we struggle to deal with this crisis. So I hope that I can share some thoughts uh, in the next uh, 15, 20 minutes on this. These are some financial disclosures. I, I want to mention that I have, uh, I'm holding a patent and I'm also a co-founder of one of these uh, telemedicine uh, ophthalmology uh, companies, essentially. So let's get started on a very broad definition of telehealth. Uh, uh, and there's many written things on it. Like essentially, it is replacing a face-to-face -face standard traditional consultation, right? And it's with a variety of tools. It can be uh, the older days would be telephone, and then, of course, video, and then now there's many different technology. And the history of telehealth has really focused on really, I would say, three uh, areas first. First was the availability of expertise. So someone would want to call someone else, let's say an expert. Uh, uh, for example, there's a tele stroke program in Singapore where um, people in the peripheral hospital would want to consult a stroke neurologist. Do I treat or do I not treat and so forth? So the availability of expertise then, then was one of the start of the telehealth. And you don't need very much, basically a phone call uh, and some sharing of some information. Then we subsequently went to improve the access to care, right? In other words, people saying not everyone could access care. Uh, can we improve uh, people living in rural regions? Uh, do they always need to travel to cities and so forth? And then the last and very most important thing has been this whole concept that they want to increase the efficiency of care. And therefore, it's not just in what I would say developing countries, but even in very densely urban countries, including Singapore, where people say, why do you need telehealth? I mean, you have a, it's a 40 kilometers by 30 kilometers, right? Uh, you know, you can get from one end of the island to another in the COVID, uh, you know, our lockdown period, probably half an hour now is not one hour because of traffic jams again, but improve the efficiency and therefore lower the cost. So I think there's been a lot of changing thoughts about this. I want to say that when we look at telehealth, there's many, many concepts. And I want to just say that it is not a one size fits all, right? The original thing, as I mentioned, was a provider to provider synchronous same day, exactly what I mentioned, tele stroke, right? So I want to consult someone, do I start treatment or not, essentially. And then of course, then it became like a patient provider whereby, you know, you can do a video consult and you can kind of talk to patients that are on chronic disease and whether or not you need treatment and so forth, patient provider. And then there was the whole idea that you don't have to do it on the same day. And there was some asynchronous store and forward uh, technology that allowed uh, uh, us to be able to do it. Subsequently, even in the community setting, they would meet or they would receive some kind of care, not necessarily with a doctor, but maybe a nurse or a healthcare worker. And then you can have what we call patient provider, provider, synchronous same day uh, system, right? So in some areas, for example, and I'll talk a little bit about that, you could see, let's say someone who can check the vision, do a little bit of test, and those tests can be transmitted by provider to a provider at, let's say, a tertiary hospital. Right? So that's that provider-provider -provider relationship. Of course, you can do it asynchronous. Newer technologies allows you to replace maybe a provider with what we call patient technology provider. So you collect the data, not necessarily with someone measuring it, but maybe it's a smartphone or a wearable or other internet of things devices. And then Lastly, you may not even need that provider and you get results with a patient technology interrelationship. That's where AI comes in. So I think this gives you a sense that, you know, there are many things you can do. And the whole idea that uh, it's a one-size-fits-all really doesn't stand. Now, I would say that uh, uh, Topo and Dorsey, who are really thinkers of this, noticed that there are about three trends. And that's 2016, right? So it's a few years ago. At that time, the first is that it's now moving from the first two points, as I said, expertise and access to care to now more convenience and cost and systems. So it is applicable as much to Guangzhou, to Singapore, to Hong Kong, to Melbourne, as it is to vast countries of rural systems, because I think it can improve the system's efficiency. The second is that it's expanded from that acute episodic, I mentioned stroke, towards 
managing of long-term chronic conditions. So could you manage diabetes completely 10 years with telehealth? That's a question. That's, that would be very powerful, essentially. And of course, the migration, as I said, from what we said is a bricks and motor patient provider to what is patient technology and web. That's where AI can come into there. So lots of exciting things happening in the telehealth field. But I would say that it's a difficult history. It's not easy. And a lot of it is what I would say non-technical barriers and opposition. So you have strong supporters, the people that dial in on this call, and they believe that that's the new future. It, going to be higher standards, reduce costs, and you have those that are completely against it, right? And when we started doing some of this, uh, I think Dr. Gavin Tan, one of the council members, uh, who I just had a very good long chat today, I mean, we are struggling with the fact that, you know, in SNEC, we have about 80 doctors, maybe uh, 20 people believe in it, and the other 60 says, I don't believe in it. Maybe it's, I can't provide the care that I want to provide. So it's going to be not easy to do this, is that it? And of course, the impact of COVID being such a huge problem itself is in the Chinese saying of Weizi, right? Danger provides that opportunity. I'm sure Ming and others understand this work very well because I think that if you don't take the opportunity now, what are you going to do? And why is there that opportunity? The opportunity is because there seems to be a lot of elements, and I'll bring back the elements and then in the discussion, we can talk about the elements. I mean, Ming was sharing that even if the hospitals are allowed to open, they're only allowed to see half of the patients. So where is where are you going to see the other half of the patients? Right? I mean, safety and some concerns about where you're going to see it. So one of the opportunities of COVID may be for tele-ophthalmology. Now, I'm going to talk about AI because it's interlinked, although it is not the same. And I think, of course, AI went through the same problems. Many good research, decades of disappointment because... Basically, it's a nice technology, and yet it is difficult to implement, essentially, right? And, you know, of course, Google has got into it, and there's deep learning and so forth. But telehealth is not AI, and I want to emphasize this very clearly. Some people always say, oh, you're going to give a talk on telehealth, are you going to talk about AI? And not the same. They're synergistic. I think they're complementary, but they're not the same. You can have telehealth without AI, and you have AI without telehealth, but together they are powerful and they will be supported by the next generation of those technologies that we are all hopefully will see soon, essentially, right? So there is some urgency to be met and in this uh, nice editorial, uh, it really summarizes the situation in the US, but in many parts of the world, right? We are stuck in an analog system. Many companies are, you know, going towards digital solutions and we are stuck with a bricks and mortar system that we have been comfortable for in years. And I think we are not comfortable with this replacing this face to face. And I think that every industry is undergoing transformation, not just the standard airlines or hotels uh, or transport, but the service industry, the digital, the finance industry, the truck, uh, and then you're now even talking about, of course, retail and so forth. So I think there's some urgency there. When you look at even Asia Pacific, there is that increased um, sense that people will be willing to do it, not just telemedicine, but all the other digital technologies. And this is a very interesting paper that just came up, right? And the graph shows you as the number of cases increases, so did the search volume for telehealth and telemedicine increase at the same time. Suggesting that, you know, I think this has caused consumer and patients to say, how am I going to get to see my doctors? Is it possible for me to get care without that face-to-face -face opportunity? So I think we should not lose sight of it. So telehealth and AI has gotten through this nice peak and then a little bit of that disappointment. And then, of course, in that plateau, could it therefore be an opportunity in, for us in the COVID era. I think I'm going to speak about this. Now, before I go into COVID itself, I'm going to talk about diabetic retinopathy because I think that holds a lot of foundational lessons for us uh, in that screening program. And I think if we do not forget, if we do not remember the lessons of diabetic retinopathy screening, I think we will end up with grasping for a lot of fed 
without evidence, right? So what does that mean as a case study? So in diabetic retinopathy, there are some core elements which I want to emphasize because I think that's important for us when we're going to go into telehealth and teleophthalmology in particular, right? And that is that the teleophthalmology part is a big circle. The AI is actually a relatively small circle. In fact, in many places, we have not implemented AI. And the IT system is very simple. Standard camera, simple IT architecture. You don't need uh, GPUs, none of those things. And I think that these are important elements, right? So you have, of course, for teleophthalmology, for diabetic retinopathy, clear public health problem single modality image, simple camera, simple, relatively simple infrastructure, a diagnosis that does not require anything else, right? You can diagnose it on photographs. You don't need to know the vision. You don't need to know the symptoms. You have robust outcome and cost-effective studies over now probably two decades. And the impact of change, very importantly, does not affect any of us sitting on or listening to this because it is on GPs, primary care providers, who are not really interested in diabetic retinopathy screen. And I think that provides an important part of it. So if you ask any ophthalmologist, should you do ER screening in the primary care setting, please go ahead. I think if you solve that problem for me, we'll be very happy. Because of that, the AI technology for tele, uh, for DR screening is what I would say is an incremental than a disruptive technology. So you already have the system in place. You're now trying to implement one more part of the ecosystem. You don't have to do the whole rigmarole altogether, right? Again, that single modality allows you to train and there's many data sets because it's been around for a long time. And of course, it's lucky to get approval and so forth. And the impact, again, is really non ophthalmology So all this, I would say, are core ingredients. Now, why do I want to mention this? Because we are going to be excited about all sorts of telehealth opportunities that you see. App-based software, new funders, cameras, new OCT machines, all of them will say, let's just do telehealth, let's put it in somewhere. Does it fulfill all this criteria? I think that's the ingredient for their success. So, of course, the two famous programs that many ones, uh, Python has run one in Thailand, uh, Australia is starting some, of course, there's US and so forth, but I just mentioned one, uh, UK, which has been around for a long time. Of course, the Singapore one, very similar to the UK, which goes in the same way. And I just want to, again, emphasize the core principles of the tele ophthalmology, right? Have it in a setting that you typically don't need to see the patients, right? So this is in a primary care setting. So who does this? It has to be simple, single modality, Usually, nurses can do it. Standard, secure IT server, you don't need anything fancy. And it goes to something that it can be read by what I would say more cost-effective than ophthalmologists, but you know, technicians can be trained to do it. Simple report, it doesn't need to transmit huge loads of data. And the primary care doctors really only want to know after report whether I refer or don't refer. Very clear, simple outcomes. I think that's important for us to be able to remember. And of course, the impact, and therefore, is not ophthalmologist. So it's been successful because it doesn't challenge the speciality that is very keen about developing it and the, the speciality that, uh, you know, is interested in diabetic retinol. Even in Singapore, and I would say many other countries, you are saying, what do you do with it? And that's where the IT solution comes in. Now, you can say, and I have no... Uh, it's not really the talk on AI or anything, but you know that many solutions, that's also one that we've developed. And the idea is where does it fit? And I think that's important, right? And if you want to say, it's, is it going to be a technology that fits, you need to understand where does it fit? And I think that that is something in the workflow that we need that lesson. And the lesson is like this. If you want to screen for diabetic retinopathy, the existing test is that I see an ophthalmologist. I can either replace it with what I'll say a telehealth solution, I do a tele-screening, I can do it with graders or optometrists, and that could be the end solution of everything. I don't need anything else. I don't need AI. In fact, it's been shown that this is relatively cost-effective. But if I want an AI solution, I either replace that with different technology, or I could do something, what I'll call some triaging, which is what we are trying to do here in, in, in Selena. And I think that, you know, that just shows you one of the ways, but I think it's important to understand this. Now, I'm going to talk about 
one other condition because it has been a big problem and there's a lot of interest in glaucoma people, specialists, Ming being a glaucoma specialist, Robert and so forth uh, will understand this. Right? It's been a little bit harder in glaucoma because of the things that it does not look like for DR. I think the screening for glaucoma doesn't have that same level of evidence. And so when you don't have level of evidence, you need to understand it's not about teleophthalmology, it's whether or not you should screen for glaucoma. I think that's important. The fact that you need such amount of multimodality is a challenge. So you need, therefore, very complex, multiple data sets transmitted over different platforms. And therefore, when you're trying to put AI in this system when there's no telehealth framework, unlike diabetic retinopathy, you're basically going to have to do both simultaneously, right? And that's uh, always a challenge. You're going to say, I'm going to convince people to use it for screening and teleophthalmology, and there's an AI solution. So I think that's important. And of course, what is the impact of that change is quite important. And I, I just show this so that people understand that, you know, you need all those things and you can develop individual solutions, but it's not easy. Now, I'm going to go into the last part of this talk, which is talking about what does it mean now that we have the lessons that we've heard, essentially, right? This shows you a bit about SNEC, right? This is our volume, 5,000, 6,000 pre-COVID in January. Um, and typically, the line, uh, you know, the red shows you people that have appointment that don't come, so their no-shows are, uh, you know, about 15%. And of course, we had a series of measures like everybody else uh, that started you know, decanting patients, segregation of teams, rescheduling operations, and then there was a lockdown in Singapore because there's a second wave. And I think we really saw a significant drop in our numbers so that, you know, at the end, we were seeing about 15% of our entire volume, right? So what it looks like in Singapore would be typically like this, you know, a normal kind of clinic, not unlike uh, all my colleagues and my friends, and I'm sure some of your participants understand this, and they became like this, essentially, right? Lockdown period, nothing's happening, only real emergencies can you see, essentially, right? And the question is, when that happens like this, you can sustain it for one, two months, and then people start coming in. What is that next situation? And so how do we handle the patients that are booked in, right? Do, the gray bars are those that are booked previously. I haven't even put in those that have been postponed, essentially. So there's a huge demand there. How do you scale up there? So as our team is thinking a little bit about the considerations there, everyone is now struggling a little bit with the new normal. Let me just share some thoughts which I think are important for us here. The first is that patient and staff safety remains a concern. There's still that unclarity whether there's going to be asymptomatic case that's going to be coming, no matter what you want to do for symptoms. Second, the infrastructure that we have does not allow us to see back that same volume because we need safe distancing and so forth. So I think it's difficult for us to be able to see that same thing. And then I think there's a huge business impact and we do need new models to be able to survive in the long term because you know uh, we cannot simply keep the same number of doctors and nurses and everybody on that kind of volume for long, essentially. Right? So the implications are the following. Right? You need to have new care pathways probably fewer face-to-face -face clinic visits because you don't want them coming in. You're not sure. Second, when they come in, minimum time, minimum touch points. So likely you want to do things outside as much as possible. So when they come in, it's just to see the doctor and maybe for the treatment. You need to start thinking a little bit about our work schedules. Many of our doctors are now on this half team basis. Some work from home. We are going to go on to shift or some of our nurses. So this really lends itself to, can they do something while they're at home and you know, do some consult over that pain? So I think that also lends itself on this. And then finally, I think quite important for the hospital and even for us to do that digital transformation. Interface is quite important. We have a lot of clunky interface problems. The IT infrastructure, upskilling and changing the culture that we have. But I would say that there are three major opportunities. First, widespread interest. Many people are very keen about this. Second, patients and physicians are all showing interest in this. So I think it's not 
abnormal for even older people to say, we're going to do this online. They understand it. They have bought food, they have bought clothes, they have bought all their groceries online. So they understand that this is a prop. Uh, uh, this is important. And I think regulators have allowed for some of this. So I think these three factors creates that ecosystem for us to do develop this. Now, I'm just going to run through some models. We can talk about this. A lot of it is developed by Gavin, so he can speak a bit about this. The video consult, the types of virtual clinics, and those kind of home monitoring. And one way to look at it is where does it fit, right? So this will be a normal standard clinic appointment anywhere. Uh, in uh, the world, and you could say that uh, some patients you need to see them, and some patients you maybe don't need to see them, and they can they get their investigation done in the community, and therefore have a video consult with you, right? That could be one model, and this is something that we have tried with our glaucoma colleagues. Another model would be like this: some that needs active treatment continue to need to see you; those that do not stable retinal disease that you know you're not going to treat. Could they have it all the tests done outside? And then only for certain cases they need to come in. So the community care for some of this reduces that appointment there. And then there are other things, right? So for example, could you have your visual acuity check at home on the app so that when you come in, you shorten that entire time and you go home just with that quick appointment? Or could you have home monitoring that allows you to be able to come in? So these are opportunities. Now, I'm going to finish off that although the opportunities are large, there remain significant barriers. And I think we need to take that into consideration. Right? It is not just technology. A lot of people always think it's technology. Give me the IT per person, do it, and we'll be fine. Technical factors are important, but seriously, it's the non-technical factors. The clinician champion, does the professional body such as APTOS support it? Do we know how it fits with workflow and other training and other support? So I think it's important for us to have guidelines, professional body support, and I will encourage APTOS, uh, which we would probably should come up with some of these evidence-based guidelines. And finally, important to understand patients' concerns. So we launched this in Singapore just last month, right? Because we said we better do it. So do a telemedicine of a glaucoma patient. Immediately, we got a patient feedback, you know, who was saying that, uh, why don't you just increase your supply, right? You know, don't just ask us not to come in because we are old, we don't know computers, we don't know how to do video calls. So I think understanding that patient's concern is quite important or you can push out programs and patients will not want to do it. So let me conclude this talk by hopefully giving you enough meat for the discussion that we hopefully in Aptos and in this era, much more relevant for us to transform eye care using digital technology, including of course tele-ophthalmology, which has been made significantly with the DR screening program and some AI, maybe less application, but certainly an important part. And I think that is a unique opportunity in a new normal. So I think with that, thanks very much for the chance to share and uh, hopefully we'll see you in one day in Singapore. Thank you very much. So thank you so much, Tan, for your wonderful talk, very visionary. So uh, for the sake of time, I will just go straight to the panel discussion. So can I just invite uh, Dr. Robert Chen, actually uh, he's in uh, San Francisco. He's actually uh, still in the somehow epidemic, uh, epicenter of this pandemic. Uh, I know this uh, California is remain challenging. So, Robert, thank you very much for joining the conference at our meeting uh, at 5 a.m. So, can you just share a little bit what's happening in, 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 in San Francisco and what do you think, what, what's your practice, I mean, in the COVID-19 and what do you uh, um, understand? Thanks, Professor Chen, for a really uh, excellent summary and lecture of all of the challenges and opportunities uh, for telehealth. Um, and basically at Stanford right now, uh, we certainly had a couple months of lockdown and we didn't do any elective cases and we had to increase our personal protective equipment, establish new policies for hygiene precautions, uh, make sure that everyone was trained. And I think um, you know, during that time we did get some telehealth going 
particularly because the U.S. government decided to reimburse for telemedicine visits, which has always been a big business, mo um, business model problem in the U.S. Um, to really get scale for telemedicine. Um, so, you know, as mentioned in the lecture, it really depends on what kind of problem and if you're doing it in real time or asynchronously and what kind of data you're viewing with the patients and you know, how amenable they are. Certainly in Silicon Valley, a lot of patients you know, uh, embrace technology. Uh, it's sort of a, a bias area. And you know, when they have a lot of concerns now, you know, they're already sometimes taking photos of their eye and sending it to us inside of our electronic record. So this just sort of facilitated that kind of um, uh, practice in terms of you know, someone's afraid of coming in, but they still you know, need a triage level answer of how serious something is or how, how much they can push something off. We, we would do more of that kind of uh, consultation and recommendations. The neuro-ophthalmologists could definitely do more uh, exams because in terms of exam techniques, how much do you, like in glaucoma, you really need an eye pressure. So you know, can't really do that with just a video consult. Although we did start doing um, like a drive-through IOP checks where the patient would just come in to the parking lot, uh, roll down their window, and we would check vision and check an eye care tonometer with no anesthetic pretty you know, quickly, record that value, and then either tell them on the spot you know, when they needed to come back, uh, because that was just you know, trying to decide the emergency level situation, or actually um, doing a phone consultation follow-up, figuring out what you know, the testing that's needed, because in glaucoma, pretty much as you saw with multimodal um, testing, that's, you can almost do telemedicine with all of those data points if you had them uh, in terms of decision making towards changing therapy or deciding on surgery. So I think it's very condition specific. You know, um, retina is still doing a lot of injections. We, we um, had postponed a lot of elective things, but all urgent things we were open for. Of course, we had a workforce reduction. Um, so, you know, that's still ongoing right now. We can't really get back to the same volumes. Obviously, we do a lot of spacing uh, in the clinic you know, six feet apart so that four uh, patients are waiting in the car, they're checking in remotely, not all the visitors can come in, we call them from the phone. Um, we have shields everywhere, everyone's wearing masks, we, we give masks to all the patients who, who still come in, uh, so that way um, we kind of standardize uh, reducing hopefully community spread and, um, you know, we, we want to do more telemedicine situations but it's, I think it's a very, uh, you have to find the sweet spot, right? You need something that is simple to execute. Um, people would feel comfortable with that kind of care. You know, a lot of times if they're gonna come in to get something done anyway, they want to know the answer right away rather than have do another callback later, right? Because you know, most of ophthalmology, we need a lot of testing and you can't always do that from home. At least, um, you know, we're trying. Like for example, let's say visual fields, you know, we're studying VR headsets, uh, virtual reality visual fields, like all eyes, uh, palm scan, et cetera, to see well, what, what kind of additional information could that give you besides you know, being, having them come into the office to do fields, then send them home and then call them back. Because at, at that point, if they already came in anyway, they, they kind of want to still see us to know what, what's coming next. So there are a lot of those you know, expectation barriers and um, varies both from the doctor side and the patient side of, of, well, if it was forced because of COVID and everything was shut down, okay, I'll accept telemedicine. But if I had still, you know, the chance to do face-to-face, -face, generally humans want to have that interaction because they, they tend to, you know, in the U.S., see us, you know, continuously because it's like you establish a relationship with their doctor rather than just, okay, you're the glaucoma doctor of the day and I'm, you know, I don't have an appointment. I just see the glaucoma service, which is sometimes a little bit different in busier clinics. But in the U.S., people really come back to see that specific person. They make appointments. It's not like a walk-in or waiting basis. So we have to be, you know, aware. But certainly um, answering questions, calling back, you know, you have to have the infrastructure for that. I mean, there's all these privacy rules and documentation rules. So we've been using, you know, both the EPIC system within our electronic health record, a very expensive system. But then, of course, people, you know, have difficulties logging in, uh, signing up, et cetera. So then we start using Zoom sometimes through the phone or start using Doximity Dialer. Uh, so there are a lot of third-party solutions because the government uh, designated that they were HIPAA acceptable. Uh, so everyone is always basically trying workarounds. And I think that's why, where the opportunity comes in from the 
COVID situation. Uh, so not to take too, up too much more time, but you can see that there's a lot to discuss, you know, in terms of um, the COVID protection angle for doctors and patients and who, who's appropriate to come in, as well as the telemedicine angle of which are the conditions that lend itself well to doing video consultations. Thank you. So any, uh, any particular comments on this, uh, uh, for example, from Aravind? So in India, how do you handle this massive amount of patients who come to like, your, in our vein, you handle like more than 200,000 OPD visits in a year. So, so can I have Dr. Dr. Kim and, and Tosi? Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Ian Wong, for that wonderful introductory talk on heavy medicine. In, uh, I mean, we have had uh, quite a challenges because of these lockdowns. And uh, we used to see about quite a lot of patients every single day, uh, close to almost 2,500 patients every single day in one hospital. But that has come down very, very drastically. And uh, but then, uh, we had quite a few challenges uh, restricting patients coming to the hospital also because we were only open for emergencies uh, as advised by the government. Fortunately, uh, the government of India and the Medical Council of India approved and came out with guidelines for telemedicine at this time in March 2020, mainly, and this was accelerated approval was given only because of the COVID crisis. So there was a big boost for telemedicine and subsequently we developed some video consultation uh, platforms in a very quick fix way to create or to reach out to patients, especially those patients who had uh, post-op patients who had follow-up uh, issues. So we had to reach out to those patients. So we, uh, from the hospital, we reached out using these platforms or the, on video consultation to talk to those patients. We also did a lot of almost 200 to 300 teleconsultations every single day to these patients uh, to reach out to them so that they were reassured or re, uh, I mean, assured of their ocular status. Only if they had some problem, we reached out and asked them to come over. And of course, you know, following the strict norms or uh, protocols that were defined during this period, uh, we were able to manage those patients. So now we are kind of open. We are up to about 40% of our volume uh, today. Thank you. Uh, yeah, well, the one other thing we couldn't do is to be we using a lot of uh, primary care centers for teleconsultation earlier, but they couldn't be opened only because of this lockdown. People could not reach to those primary care centers in those rural areas. Otherwise, that would have been a wonderful opportunity to reach most of the patients in those areas. But now we are all open and all of the primary care centers, we are seeing about close to 400 patients a day, uh, 400 teleconsultations we are doing across these in primary care centers, apart from what we do in the base hospital. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mini. Yes. That's, that's for yes. I think we got a, a couple of questions uh, from the audience, but I, I just wanted to uh, open this, uh, I mean, make the most of this opportunity that to allow our council member to speak out. So and anybody just uh, unmute your, your microphone and just uh, just share your ideas on uh, uh, telemedicine and also COVID-19 uh, situation. Thank you. Yeah. Please go ahead and mute and just go share. Yeah, uh, well, uh, Ming, I, I agree totally with, with Robert in terms of, in fact, ideally we would like to see patients, right? We'd like to maintain, I mean, doctor-patient relationship. That's the ideal situation. And that's what we like to do. However, well, telemedicine, I think, is indicated in a certain situation. And COVID-19 made that opportunities grow like bigger and bigger. The thing is, well, um, how are we going to keep balance in terms of seeing patients face-to-face -face and doing telemedicine? I think this kind of balance is quite difficult. I think it's quite difficult how we're going to select cases to have telemedicine. Of course, well, glaucoma or some other chronic cases that may not need to see doctors. That's like, well, 
that's the uh, maybe the the good example of cases yeah. that so, may need telemedicine. So coma is exactly the patient they really need to see the doctor because they want to go. Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. But then so, they, yeah, so that, they don't need a prescription for the eye job because they can stop the eye job basically. Yeah. So it's quite. Uh, yeah. 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 So yeah. So that's what my my point. Well, we need to keep well good patient doctor relationship, right? And we need to keep balance between this relationship and telemedicine, which is not face to face. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Any other comments on our council members, please? Yeah. So I would just like to add, I think it, it, it is an opportunity and you need to ensure there's balance, but we need to assess what what are the risks involved in in, in our normal set of operations, there are already risks involved. And I mean, I think the Arvin model is a great model of how they have assessed the risk. If they don't provide the um, telemedicine service to these community centers, these, then the patients get no care at all. And they suffer with blindness a lot of times for the rest of their productive lives. So I think what this has forced us to do is, is firstly, during a lockdown, you, you obviously are not able to see all your patients. So you scramble to, to create some form of teletriage. That might be a phone call or some other form of communication that allows you to assess whether the patient has any emergency risk. As we move, so the more difficult part comes right now where we are at the in-between stage. And that's the reality. Everybody, not just medicine, businesses are grappling with it. We can't go back to business as usual, obviously. Um, but the risk is not so great that if a patient shows up in your clinic, they're going to die. This is not Ebola. So we, we really need, it needs to be a concerted effort to triage and triage is very, very difficult um, and has to be done within a local context because your local population is going to have different assessment of risk and benefit. And then you need to try and apply it. And I, I think what the first speaker said is very, very important. Once you start applying it, you really need to collect data to ensure what you're doing works. Um, and in the long run, this will make, although it will be a learning lesson, there will be some patients you do a disservice to because you were not able to see them. But at least you are then able to create that body of evidence uh, and who knows? I mean, nobody would wish that upon us, but this situation could last for years, in which case then the learning would, would have benefit. And I don't know, we used to think pandemics come every 100 years, but we had SARS 17 years ago, MERS about six years ago. So it just feels like H1N1 about nine years ago, the frequency keeps getting more and more often. Yeah. I think Ang I saw Angus just unmute. Oh yeah, hello Ming, thank you. Um, great comments all around. In Western Australia, where I'm based, um, the regions got closed down for transport and travel, and some regions don't have ophthalmologists. So the optometrists were able to step in as a kind of, but also provide that patient interface in a community setting. And uh, I hear your points about the patient-doctor relationship, but funnily enough, my patients sometimes seem to have better rapport on the internet because they see you as the doctor from the TV and you turn up and do some surgery and there's an interesting rapport there um, that is established. So it doesn't have to be excluded. And we'll certainly be monitoring and auditing what we're doing and hopefully present through this forum uh, the big increase we've had in telehealth in West Australia. In the Australia, actually, uh, the government is very kind. They set up a temporary MBS. MBS is like a Medicare claim uh, item number for uh, uh, tele telehealth uh, consultation. So I actually, uh, when the, during the epidemic, 20% of my patients, I just make a phone call and then I can charge, uh, I can charge them. So, so it's a uh, very, very nice uh, setup because if telemedicine, we've got to have someone pay for it. If you do it, for, nobody do it for free. So it's so hard to maintain it if it's free, for, for free. So, yeah. Um. Uh, Ming, can I mention a little bit about this payment? I think a lot of people always say, uh, who's going to pay for it? The government's going to pay for it. And I think that part there as a society, we need to really think very carefully, right? People are willing to pay for $30, $40 of food delivery, uh, you know, uh, and, uh, you know, now and 
all sorts of online stuff has those charges. And when it comes to their care, and they keep saying, how come it is not uh, paid by the government or somebody else is going to pay for it? I think this part here is something that uh, uh, as, uh, uh, you know, for ophthalmologists and for all of us in this field, you know, it's something, you know, it's always a hindrance. It is given by people to say it's a hindrance. But as you know now, right, I mean, everything, uh, people pay stuff online with their credit cards all, all the time for much less uh, uh, essential things. And healthcare now, I mean, if you think about it, it is the foundation of the economy, right? I mean, no healthcare, everyone's stuck. You look at the, how much uh, money, uh, you know, each economy has suffered because of healthcare. So I think uh, both trying to get a government to pay for it is important, but also just tell the patients and the companies uh, that, uh, uh, you know, and the private companies, it's not expensive in the overall scheme of things. Sure, yeah. Yeah, any other comments? Uh, any, any comments? Hi, uh, real, real from yeah. Japan. Yeah, please, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I totally agree that the um, the, the uh, like infrastructure for telemedicine to make it uh, feasible and um, you know to support the long long term, uh, not just by the technical issue but the funding and the insurance issue. The interesting thing is in Japan, telemedicine is now fully covered by national healthcare insurance, and um, there is a ten times increase in the user of telemedicine in total, but in ophthalmology field, there is not much gain even during this, the last last few months. Basically because, you know, there's no way to secure the eye examination. So just the interview or just the, uh, like a, how's your, you know, eye feeling, that, that's, that's doable, but uh, because we don't have uh, like a mobile device or no other eye exams, you know, even uh, not just physician, but the, the, the patient themselves feels uncomfortable, so they don't use the telemedicine, even they're covered by the insurance. So I think we definitely need to have a, like a responsible way to get the detailed, at least reliable eye examination, either by like a screening center or either by mobile device or whatever new technology, maybe AI. So we definitely need to have you know, both things. At the same same speed. Yes, I agree. Yes. So, so good. I think uh, we are getting uh, very close to the end of the one hour uh, webinar. I think one hour is always too short, and two hours could be short. Uh, so, but then I I would like to uh, take this opportunity. Thank you very much, in particular for the other council member and also our participants. Uh, we as a as an organization try to put more telemedicine. I think the next step, we, we got to, for example, to create an open forum that allow people to contribute their uh, experience, like sharing, even share a small, small video, small idea, that people can uh, come together and uh, achieve a consensus and how we're able to deliver telemedicine better. And then so that a patient can have better access to care. So uh, thank you very much again to the participant and uh, see you in the, in the, in the email and, uh, and the email communication in the, in the Chani forum, but also for the, uh, in the next July webinar. Thank you so much for your contribution. Thank you. Thank you very much. See you next time. Have a great day. Thank evening. you, Ming. Yeah, thank you. Have a good day also. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. See thank you. you everyone. Yeah. Bye, everyone. Goodbye, everyone. Uh, thank you. Yeah. Goodbye. Thanks, yeah. 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 Nice lecture. Okay. Tian. Yeah. yeah, nice meeting you, at least. Hi. At least on the screen, not in person, but on the screen. Yeah, see you. Yeah. Yeah. Very difficult to shake hands now, yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay, good. Yeah. yeah, okay, all good. Thank you.